Um, good morning and welcome to our deep dive on decoding policy and regulation, how to make a difference in the electricity industry. Um, so again, I want to thank the panelists and all of you for joining us today. I think this is going to be a really great, um, what should have been an interactive workshop in person, uh, but today we're doing it via Zoom webinar. But we do want to hear from you, so at the end of our presentations, we will be answering questions and hopefully interacting with those of you who want to do that with us. Um, your mics are muted, so um, please use the Q&A tool at the, I think, bottom of your menu bar. Um, so I'm Danielle Duran, and I work at the National Museum of Natural History. I'm also, in my former life, I was, uh, I worked at an electric utility and worked at a regulatory commission. So I'm a little bit of a junkie on this particular topic, but that isn't why we're doing this. Um, we're doing this because electricity still really matters to the story of climate change. It was surpassed by the transportation industry as the number one source of carbon dioxide emissions in 2016, and that was due largely to the addition of renewable energy onto the system, as well as coal, coal plant closures uh, and more efficient coal plants. Um, there are some other things happening in the electricity industry that are very interesting to us, and there are a lot of opportunities to make more change. And some of those people who are working very hard in this area are two of our panelists, our two panelists, uh, Anna Unra Cohen, and Rebecca, uh, I never say her last name right, Kamaludin, um, so she'll correct me later. They are fantastic women who have a great story to tell. Um, we're gonna talk about the difficult, complex uh, world of policy and regulation that electricity, the electricity industry operates within by telling you stories of uh, things that have passed uh, and um, what we see on the future at the national level, as well as the state and local levels. So um, now I'm gonna stop sharing and invite Anna to start her presentation. Thanks, Danielle. I appreciate the invitation and for everyone um, joining us today, just give me a minute while I get um, my PowerPoint up here. Um, I hope everyone is uh, doing well in place um, as we go forward. Um, as Danielle said, I'm Anna Unruh Cohen. I'm uh, currently the staff director for the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, I'm actually a climate scientist by education and came to D.C. on a fellowship that brings scientists to work in Capitol Hill. Uh, and found this whole new career uh, working on climate and energy policy, which is what I've been doing for about the last um, 19 years, uh, mostly on Congress, uh, mostly in Congress, uh, but sometime outside at think tanks and advocacy organizations, but still working closely on federal climate and clean energy policy. So hopefully you're joining this um, deep dive to learn a little bit more about what you can do uh, to help make the world a better place. Um, and there's lots of places uh, and levels you can engage on, whether it's at your local level, your state level, your county level, at the federal government, in Congress, or in the executive branch, or some of the regulatory agencies um, that we'll talk about today. Um, but it's hard work and you have to stick with it um, to accomplish something. So uh, this quote from St. Francis of Assisi, um, I think really helps encapsulate uh, what you need to do. Um, and I'm sure you are all motivated by things that you see as necessary to change in the world. Uh, and hopefully you can find like-minded people to work with you on that. And suddenly uh, you're doing the impossible. Uh, doesn't help to, it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of prayer uh, thrown in there too for those of you um, who are um, spiritual people. Um, and this week, Earth Week, um, is a great time to think about all of that. Uh, yesterday, hopefully, you were able to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, the first one was back in 1970. But it wasn't just like a, a switch got flipped and suddenly we had a massive 
mobilization of people um, demanding clean air and clean water. There was a buildup to it. And so again, doing what's necessary um, to move to what then seems like accomplishing the impossible. Um, so just a little bit of history. Um, you all probably know Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, um, which really captured the public's imagination and helped mo mobilize them to advocate for clean air and clean water and protecting um, wildlife. And in fact, the very first Clean Air Act was signed into law back in 1963. Um, so it's even older uh, than 50 years. Um, and it was very focused on public health. So even back then, people knew air pollution um, harmed uh, people's health and they wanted to change that. And even when it comes to climate, which seems like a very new issue, uh, way back in 1965, it, President Johnson sent a message to Congress about pollution. And one of the things he called out was the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, and that that could, um, that could cause uh, changes to our world. Um, and so that outpouring, uh, massive outpouring uh, on Earth Day in 1970 galvanized a lot of um, federal activity and congressional activity to put in place new laws, including the 1970 Clean Air Act, um, which um, strengthened the existing bills. It empowered the newly created Environmental Protection Agency to go about, uh, to take actions to clean up the air. Um, and what the EPA was supposed to do um, was to protect public health and welfare. And so while Congress called out some specific pollutants back in 1970, it also said to the EPA, if you see other pollution that is hurting public health, then you, need, you have the authority to take action um, to reduce that pollution. And even back in 1970, when you're talking about what, is, what are the things that impact public health and welfare, climate was already there in the law um, back in 1970. So I just highlight um, that little mention of climate from the 1970s uh, definition. But like anything, uh, you have to keep working at it, keep improving it. Um, and so there were additional amendments to the Clean Air Act over the years, including a big one in 1990, um, which added in um, a cap and trade program uh, for sulfur dioxide to reduce acid rain, uh, which was coming out of uh, the sulfur dioxide was coming from burning coal. Um, so um, moving, uh, so that all happened in 1990. But even with all of that effort, um, as you can see by the chart, uh, carbon dioxide was still going up in the atmosphere and we kept, and we still see the increasing temperature um, that comes with just the basic physics and chemistry of adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So um, the issue of climate change, global warming, the earth heating up, um, is, has become uh, is more and more an issue uh, going forward. And so that brings us um, to the early 2000s and when I first um, came to DC. Uh, when I came here, President Bush was in the White House, Republicans controlled the House and Congress, and there was a lot of talk, uh, energy was an issue right there, and um, there was a lot of work in those years um, to put, put together an energy bill which um, was done in 2005. And you can see a couple of the, the major points here. Uh, there were attempts to do some things like raise fuel economy, some other actions um, that would have been help uh, reduce carbon pollution. Um, and those were rejected at that time. But the issue of energy and climate change did not go away. Um, and so in 2007, President Bush is still in the White House, but Democrats now control Congress, um, and a new energy bill was passed, uh, which increased fuel economy for the, in automobiles for the first time in 30 years, um, and also set up a re renewables fuel standard that had carbon dioxide as one of the metrics um, to approve fuel. So a, a first initial step uh, incorporating climate. In the House, uh, we passed a national renewable electricity standard, uh, through that process, but the Senate um, couldn't 
couldn't get it done. So ultimately it was not in the final bill uh, that was signed into law, which the two pictures at top um, is the bill signing ceremony. I was lucky enough to be there. And there's President Bush and then Speaker Pelosi and Majority Leader Reid. Um, so the three people who came together uh, to get that bill um, into law. So, um, but energy and climate, that was still there. The 2007 energy bill did not solve all of those issues. Uh, we also unfortunately had the financial crash of 2008, uh, which put us in a similar position to where we are today, unfortunately, with needing economic um, stimulus and recovery. So in 2009, in the Recovery Act, um, there was a huge investment in um, clean energy, and this was especially important for wind and solar uh, and really helped um, set the stage um, for some of the dramatic changes that we've seen in the electricity sector over the last decade. But the House also wanted to tackle the issue of climate change. Um, and so we worked um, to pass, the House passed the American Clean Energy and Security Act. Uh, it's sometimes known as Waxman-Markey, and uh, you can see Waxman and Markey. Uh, Markey was my boss at the time, um, down in the corner of this slide. Um, and the, uh, the bill had a cap and trade uh, to reduce carbon dioxide. Um, and other greenhouse gases, but um, it also had things like a national renewable electricity standard and energy efficiency and building standards. So it was comprehensive um, and dealt with, um, tried to deal with a whole range of climate issues. Um, but as you probably know, the Senate wasn't able to pass a bill, so we never got that comprehensive climate um, piece of legislation um, to President Obama's desk. So while all of this action was happening on Capitol Hill, there were also other things that were important, which ultimately um, led to the Obama administration putting together the Clean Power Plan. Back in 2007, the Supreme Court ruled in Massachusetts versus EPA that the, that the EPA could regulate um, carbon dioxide and other carbon pollutants um, as, air, as an air pollutant under their existing authority under the Clean Air Act. So going back to that definition in 1970 that said um, things that change the climate could be pollutants. Um, and so what the EPA had to do in order to use that authority was to actually do a science-based process to see if indeed carbon pollution um, threaten public health and welfare. And so uh, the EPA in 2009 finished that under the direction of Administrator uh, Lisa Jackson. And so the stage was set for EPA to be able to regulate, um, regulate um, carbon pollution. Um, and the Obama administration was saying they would do that if Congress failed to legislate. Um, so Congress, um, did fail to legislate, but in the Senate, they also tried to overturn this endangerment finding, um, which also failed. So with that, all of that done, the EPA is now empowered um, to deal with the carbon pollution and what the Obama administration put together um, to, do, to deal with that in the electric utility sector was the Clean Power Plan. So it was proposed in 2014 and finalized in 2015. I was lucky enough to be at the White House um, when President Obama um, finalized or signed it uh, into effect. Um, and, but still it was controversial. Um, and so Congress again voted to, this time they succeeded in voting to overturn the EPA's action but President Obama vetoed it and there weren't enough votes in Congress to overturn it. Um, so then there are also many court challenges, um, which ultimately led to this really unprecedented ruling by the Supreme Court that the EPA should stop implementing the Clean Power Plan while the lawsuits work their way through um, the courts. Well, as it turns out, um, we, once President Trump was elected, um, his EPA, decided to repeal the Clean Power Plan and instead finalize the Affordable Clean Energy Rule in 2019. Um, 
which um, because of the Supreme Court ruling in the endangerment finding, they still are obligated to regulate um, carbon pollution. So they had to propose, propose a new rule, uh, which they did in 2019. And now there's a whole new set of lawsuits going on to see if that will be finalized. So that's um, kind of where we are um, on the rules. And um, you'll hear more about what electric utilities have actually been doing in all of that time, um, which is actually good news and a reason to be optimistic at the Earth Optimism Summit. But I want to pause for a minute here because this sort of illustrates the interplay of Congress and the federal government and the, and the, um, and the courts. And at all of those places are places where um, people and the public and stakeholders in the issue can, can put forward their ideas and make sure their senators and representatives know how they feel about the clean power plan. So whether it was when we were legislating and trying to put a bill together, we heard from all sorts, we heard from the public um, pro and con, um, and even when the uh, administration was working on the clean power plan, we would still, as a staffer in, a, in, in Congress, we would still be hearing from our bosses, constituents about what they thought about that plan. And in turn, we would be trying to influence um, the administration. The EPA itself has a whole um, rigorous procedure for public input, um, which is critical. Um, and so there was, the EPA had just really, um, a big uh, stakeholder action to hear from the public um, and impacted utilities as well. Um, and even when it comes to the courts, it's a little bit harder, but on the lawsuits, um, interested parties can still come together to file a brief to the court and say, hey, this is what we think about um, the proposal or the issues in the lawsuit. So there are lots of ways um, for the public to get involved. Um, um, as, uh, as the federal government works on energy and climate policy. But what does that mean for the future? Um, so Congress ha wasn't able to pass legislation. Um, the courts have the current EPA rule that they're looking at. Um, and so while all that's happening here in Washington, D.C., um, out in the states and the cities, there's a big movement and push going forward for 100% clean energy standards. So um, at the moment, there's 163 cities that have adopted 100% um, clean standard. There's 13 counties and there's eight states and then DC and Puerto Rico have all put something similar in place. And then we have elected officials. In the 2018 election, we had there were over 1,400 um, candidates who took a clean energy for all pledge, including um, 56 of the new members of the House who came to DC um, in 2019. So you have a growing body of elected officials who want to see us move to 100% clean future. And even on the business side, so, you know, it's to really make change in this country, you really need to knit together the public pressure um, elected official action, and then um, businesses being able to take those steps. So we already now have from some of the major utility companies across the country commitments um, for, for their operations to go to 100% clean. So there's all this pressure building at the state level in the business community, newly elected officials. And so that's translating to new legislation that we're seeing on Capitol Hill. Um, including um, bills introduced by Senator Smith from Minnesota and Representative Lujan from New Mexico to set up a national clean energy standard. Um, and so, you know, I think we'll have a moment um, coming soon in 2021 um, when it will be right again um, to see if Congress can legislate some um, clean energy and climate policies that can really help um, accelerate the reduction in um, carbon pollution that's happening in the electricity market right now. Um, and so just to close out, a couple more quotes um, apropos for Earth Day um, from the Lorax that um, really we need, uh, we need the public, we need you to care a whole awful lot um, to make things better. And then um, going back uh, kind of to what I started with, it, you do have to really um, hang in there 
uh, and remember that um, it's really the courage to continue that counts. So um, I hope this helped give you a little insight and a little inspiration uh, to be courageous in helping to make your part of the world a little better place. Thanks. Oh, um, thank you, Anna. That was that was incredibly inspiring. So I'm, you know, always excited about this work, and I hope that you feel more excited about the possibilities of change in this industry and uh, what you can do to make help make that change. Um, now we're going to have Rebecca join join us, um, and she's going to talk about uh, a little bit about the Clean Power Plan, um, FERC, and um, the electric markets and she'll explain what FERC is in her talk. Um, Rebeha, are you with us? Um, my name is Rebeha Kamaladeen, and um, I am very excited to be here um, with you all uh, for the Earth Optimism um, Deep Dive. Um, I am a shareholder at Greenberg Torig here in Washington, DC. Uh, I represent energy clients before the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, and um, I am really excited about talking to you all about the um, clean power plans uh, impacts on the electricity sector. Um, to get things started, first I just want to give you uh, an understanding of uh, what the clean power plan did, um, the foundation it laid for the electricity sector. Uh, to, to follow. Uh, without going into a whole lot of detail about, um, a, a, about that, um, the, the Clean Power Plan involved basically setting state emissions goals using um, what was somewhat of a complicated formula. Um, the first thing it did was it figured out um, what power plants were emitting as of 2012. Um, and it did that by taking stock of the nation's uh, fossil fuel power plants, figuring out what power plants were emitting as of 2012. Um, then it estimated how much power plants could reasonably cut. Um, and in doing so, um, it laid out three building blocks that set the baseline for cutting emissions. Um, the first building block being that the op that um, coal plants should be operated more efficiently, so increasing the generation efficiency of existing coal, um, coal plants or fossil fuel plants, run gas plants more often or basically coal less, um, ramp up renewable power. Uh, some sub basically that meant substituting generation from new zero carbon dioxide emitting um, re renewable resources for fossil fuel power generation. Um, the idea there was that st if states built more wind, more solar, more geothermal, hydropower, or biomass facilities, they could reduce the overall carbon intensity of their power plant fleet. Um, the EPA didn't assume that each region would install the maximum amount of clean energy that it could possibly install. What it did was it aimed the, for um, a target that would be deemed reasonable for the state from a cost-wise perspective. Um, and from that, the EPA figured out the effects of applying the building blocks to power plants and then applied the power, power plant targets to each state. So the, the, the key thing about the power plan was um, that it, it allowed, um, first of all, it allowed states to um, coordinate with one another in developing their plans. They had to submit um, state plans. Um, they could also develop multi-state plans. Uh, and with those plans, they were allowed flexibility in meeting their targets using those building blocks that we just covered. They were um, free to reduce their emissions by various means. They're allowed to pick their preferred route in cutting the emissions, um, uh, their, their, their emissions, uh, 
their carbon dioxide emissions and meeting their, their targets. Um, but if they refuse to comply, the EPA basically said that they would um, step in and they would um, put in a federal program like a cap and trade. Um, so that impacted the electricity sector um, in with respect to um, and they would um, put in a federal program like a cap and trade. Um, so that impacted the electricity sector um, in with respect to um, um, the landscape, uh, the regulatory landscape um, in, in some significant ways. But first we'll talk about how the electricity industry responded. Um, first off, uh, there's actually quite a bit of support from the public utilities to the CPP plan when it was first rolled out. Only, um, I mean, it was only like 15 or less than 15% of utilities um, were uh, completely opposed to the CPP. Um, there was some significant opposition by electric cooperatives, um, mainly because a lot of them um, owned coal generation and, and nuclear generation, but especially coal. Um, two thirds of the utilities actually supported the CPP, um, which, which was quite interesting. Now the question is, um, did the CPP um, significantly change the utilities plans when it was first rolled out? And um, you know, it's, that is a little hard to tell um, because of the fact that the rollback of um, coal and nuclear power facilities had already started back in, in 2010. There are a lot of coal plants and nuclear power facilities that are being retired since 2010. So when the CPP um, came into being in 2015, it's, it is a little unclear in how much it was actually uh, it was the impetus or triggered the change in a lot of these utilities plans, but um, we, you know, but um, in any case, um, what we do know is that the utilities, by and large, um, did support the CPP. The CPP, um, um, the CPP uh, did have uh, some. Um, uh, significant impact on the regulatory landscape um, um, by way of the way the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, would focus on 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 uh, climate. Um, first of all, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, it's it's not an environmental regulator and it was not in charge of implementing the CPP, um, but it was the vehicle by which the CPP would play out and be implemented. Um, and the reason why um, it would be the vehicle is because it has the authority over wholesale sales electricity uh, and transmission electricity. Um, it has oversight authority over the reliability standards of our power system. And it's got um, a strong um, goal. It's got a, its ultimate goal, one of its ultimate goals is to promote a strong energy infrastructure um, including uh, good transmission facilities. So it had a role to play in um, the implementation of the CPP. Um, FERC's role, though, is primarily one of monitoring um, the states uh, as they develop their um, single state or multi-state plans, um, monitoring the implementation of the state plans, um, and ensuring coordination um, among the various agencies involved, um, primarily the EPA, um, the Department of Energy. Um, and in, in this process of monitoring and coordinating, um, it was charged with ensuring that um, the United States 
uh, electric uh, generation and transmission infrastructure would continue to be reliable um, during CP, the CPP implementation. Um, some of the ways that FERC would ensure uh, the continued reliability of, um, of uh, uh, generation transmission during the implementation process uh, was by um, looking to build out new natural gas infrastructure and expanding and strengthening our transmission infrastructure. So um, it was uh, definitely impacted by um, building block two and block building block three. Um, now it didn't exactly, it didn't give FERC um, any new authority to do so, and it did not um, order FERC to increase um, uh, the, or, or expand the, the infrastructure. But what it did was it, 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 it definitely gave FERC, um, 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 it, it definitely enhanced FERC's focus, uh, already existing focus and authority um, to to do both. Um, so in any so so in any case, it, it, so there's no new authority given to FERC um, um, by 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 way of these building blocks, but it absolutely did enhance its existing authority um, and incentive to um, focus on. Um, expanding the ga gas infrastructure and and um, um, ramping up renewable power by way of focusing on uh, expanding and strengthening the transmission infrastructure in the country. One of the interesting ways that it impacted the electricity landscape um, was um, um, by way of making the the uh, the regulator. Um, figure out ways to adapt the CPP um, to the energy markets. The CPP laid the groundwork for a great deal of work uh, for FERC to adapt those markets. Um, by way of background, the United States is organized by way of um, certain energy and capacity markets um, known, as the re known as regional transmission organizations and independent system operators. Um, regional transmission organizations, or RTOs, um, they coordinate, monitor, uh, and um, control the multi-state electric grid, um, um, as well ISOs do, um, uh, do, do the same, and, and both uh, basically determine how much generation is necessary to meet demand as it changes, and they also are in charge of dispatching the lowest cost generators. So the CPP matters a lot with respect to these energy markets. Um, they had a great deal of work to do to adapt these electricity markets where generation is being dispatched um, and monitored. Um, great deal of work to adapt those markets to the CPP. Um, so, um, so, uh, um, also, uh, with respect to um, adapting those markets to um, the state, um, I'm sorry, adapting the state markets uh, or the energy markets to account for the state plans um, that, that were be being put forth or uh, that would have been submitted um, under the CPP. Um, so in, in the, finally, um, in with respect to um, market act adaptation, adaptation, the rollback of the CPP um, had uh, has had a a uh, an impact. Um, the rollback of the CPP has um, basically um, left the states and regional markets to fill in the gap that is there now with respect to um, how the regulator will um, or, or FERC will uh, address the climate change um, and uh, climate change issues or climate issues, um, carbon emissions um, uh, issues with respect to infrastructure. Um, when with that, um, just recently, there was a, 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 a broad cross-section of uh, stakeholders 
that has requested FERC to um, hold a conference and workshop to talk about integrating state, regional, and na national carbon pricing in the organized regional markets. Um, they basically asking FERC to, to consider um, carbon tax um, and other carbon pricing issues um, with, with respect to um, um, how market participants and companies um, uh, would be, um, would, would face uh, uh, carbon pricing issues and carbon taxes um, in connection with their activities in the energy markets. So despite the rollback, there's still um, some activity going on at FERC with uh, market participants focusing on these, on these issues and um, wanting those issues in front of the regulator um, while they consider and um, consider project development and um, managing the electricity markets. Um, so with that, I, I will turn it back to Danielle. Um, thank you so much for having, having me. And there are plenty of ways to get involved with these discussions. Um, um, while, while FERC thinks through um, these issues, you can file comments with the regulator um, uh, expressing your ideas um, and thoughts in terms of how they should think about carbon pricing and um, uh, carbon, carbon um, resources going forward. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, that was, I think, illuminating. I always find FERC a, a difficult um, sort of place to understand. Um, for those of you who were really inspired by that, you can um, actually go to see um, FERC. It's very close by Union Station. Um, and um, it should be really, um, it should be a, a really easy thing for you to do. You can look at their schedule. So thank you, Rebecca. Um, we're gonna turn now to sort of a local case so that we can talk about um, state and local issues and sort of how those um, changes at that level can drive conversations nationally. And we'll ask Anna and Rebecca to comment on that. So um, just uh, at the first Earth um, Optimism Summit, the Georgetown, Texas um, case uh, was highlighted as uh, this incredible thing that had happened. A Republican mayor in a very red town in Georgetown, Texas, called Georgetown, Texas, announced to the world in uh, 2016 that his city, um, the city council, and he had um, decided to go 100% renewable. So there was lots of um, laudatory remarks. Uh, Al Gore went to visit um, Dale Ross. You can see them here in this slide. Um, and there, I mean, there was just a lot of um, pressure that built up because if um, a small town in Texas can go, there's about 75,000 people in, in Georgetown. If it can go 100% renewable, you know, what is, what is the pressure for everyone else to sort of move that way? Um, unfortunately, um, based on some of the vehicles that um, he chose or the city council chose to engage in, um, the prices um, that the citizens are paying or the city is paying for electricity now has gone up quite a bit. And part of that has to do with um, the amount of uh, additional energy that's on their system. So this just um, provides a vehicle um, for discussing some issues. For one, most municipalities aren't in charge of their own electricity. Um, if you are living in a city that has control of a, its own electricity for its citizens, then you're usually aware of it because you either get a bill from the city or you know which entity, for instance, Austin Energy, um, uh, actually provides your electricity to you. Um, most cities um, get their electricity from either a rural cooperative or they get it from an investor-owned utility, the largest kind of utilities, and they're regulated by a state regulatory commission. And there are obviously 50 of those across the nation. Um, and then there are other ways that um, their activities are, are um, regulated depending on transmission line requirements and distribution lines. 
So these are, you know, Georgetown, Texas is not the average case of a city that's able to buy um, for its citizens 100% uh, renewable. And also going forward, I mean, to his credit, you know, Mayor Ross couldn't have known that the marketplace would change so significantly in such a small amount of time. So how do you build policy or regulatory vehicles or even legal and financial instruments that will really, um, you know, uh, that will, will weather the test of time? So both, you know, in terms of uh, talking about where um, you might be most effective, um, you might think about whether your city is this kind of city or whether your city or state has a regulatory commission. And also, um, I really like Anna and uh, Rebeja to chime in on sort of, um, sort of the implications of this case as well as um, policy instruments and regulatory instruments in the future. Thanks, Danielle. I can just add a quick something um, building on what I said uh, earlier. And at least from, uh, you know, sitting on Capitol Hill, um, the, just the, the groundswell of cities that are, you know, reflecting their, um, the people in them um, wanting 100% renewable or 100% clean. Um, I mean, I think in that way, not getting into the nitty gritty of how you actually achieve it, just that um, putting out that signal, um, that's, that's where um, people want um, energy to go is um, kind of what's from, from my perspective, the most important thing about Georgetown. They were one of the earlier cities that has now rolled into um, you know, this collection of uh, 160 plus cities. And you know, there's more Republican mayors who have also um, adopted that goal as well. So. Thanks, Anna. Um, um, uh, uh, and I, and I, I would agree with all uh, with all of that. And I mean, George, the Georgetown, Texas case is 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 a very interesting case, um, um, and one for uh, for for um, everybody for everybody to really look at around the country and um, and think about in terms of um, um, application uh, to their own um, to their own cities. Um, in um, working with various companies around the country, one thing I have learned is that uh, the geography has made a big difference um, with respect to whether or not um, cities and and um, companies um, uh, are, are thinking about the 100% renewable uh, renewable goal. Um, in particular, um, um, places like um, Minnesota, um, Indiana, Wisconsin, places in the Midwest, um, states who are uh, states who are in regions where they deal with significant weather issues, for like for example, um, polar vortex, extreme weather conditions, um, do have some challenges to face when it comes to um, making a decision like going 100% renewable. The reason being is because um, from an operational and technical perspective, what we've learned over the years is that um, there's uh, you know, some renewable facilities that cannot operate in extreme weather conditions. So for instance, um, what we learned in the last polar vortex, um, a scenario from a year a year back uh, or so um, was that um, uh, you know wind facilities actually do have a limit in terms of weather weather um, um, a lot of them cannot operate below negative 22 23 degree temperatures so when the polar vortex came a lot of those wind facilities could not operate and um, companies ha had to rely on their natural gas facilities, but if those were in trouble, like um, I think Michigan 
uh, ended up there. There was a there was a fire at a significant natural gas facility in Michigan. They couldn't rely on that. Um, uh, they it, there was there was definitely some challenges that they faced in terms of um, how to respond. Um, and so you know with that. Um, it, you know, a, a lot of them ended up relying on their coal resources to get them through the polar vortex. So um, uh, I think that Georgetown, Texas case is an incredibly interesting one, a very inspiring one. Um, but I do acknowledge that there are challenges that are faced by uh, states and communities depending on where they live. I think a big difference would come if um, storage, energy storage, um, becomes a solid option uh, by way, and that would come once we have solidified the energy storage technology. Um, we saw that with the cap and trade program for sulfur dioxide and putting scrubbers on, um, on smokestacks to help uh, knock out um, sulfur, as well as some fuel switching and other things that happen. Um, and even now, um, you know, it has been the state renewable electricity policies coupled with um, federal tax incentives that have really also helped, um, per, you know, expand the deployment of wind and solar in particular, um, are helping to expand um, storage now. Um, so all of, you know, setting, setting those targets, the federal government saying, here's where we need to be. Um, and then allowing, you know, the innovation um, on the ground to happen to reach that is, is really kind of what you hope uh, in uh, as the sort of ideal for setting, setting policy. Um, and I think, you know, lots of utilities actually have been very straightforward, even as they're adopting these goals to be 100% clean in the future. Um, you know, they're saying, we know how to get there 80%. Um, but we have to figure out that last 20% or we know how to almost get there, but we got to figure out that last much, which is what's going to drive um, the innovation. And I think right. in the end, to Rebeja's point, it's going to drive a much more dynamic grid um, so that we'll be coupling wind and storage and perhaps a little bit of um, peaking natural gas um, to, to, you know, really have um, clean electricity. You're still muted, Daniel. I am the queen of telling people they're still muted and I, <laughs> <laughs> I keep talking while I'm muted. Um, I have a question from uh, Jesse who says, um, what do you think the renewable energy situation will look like 10 years from now in the United States? Any, any takers on that question? Um, sure, I'll dive in. Um, you know, it, it is hard to predict because it was hard to, it would have, 10 years ago when I was sitting in Congress um, trying to work on a climate bill, it was hard to predict um, that we'd be down to, you know, 30% of coal power uh, providing electricity now. I mean, that was just, that was one of an impossible thing um, that has occurred. So, um, you know, just building on my last point, I think we, you know, there's some really exciting um, storage developments that are happening. And I think people are putting a lot of emphasis on um, both new technology with batteries, but just also, you know, old traditional stuff like pumped hydro um, for storage. So I think we're going to see a big development in storage um, over the next decade, which is really going to, um, unleash um, additional renewables. We'll have a very dynamic wet, uh, a grid. I think we'll probably see some build out of the grid so that we can share resources across the broader United States. Um, and then I think the one, the big thing that I'm pretty much ready to uh, bet a big sum of money on would be the development of offshore wind. Um, so we've got just a few turbines um, off Rhode Island right now. Um, but both New York and then further north in Massachusetts, um, I think we will see build out of offshore wind, um, which will be very important uh, for the East Coast. Um, and we'll see what it means for the Gulf of Mexico, um, whether they can stand up wind there or not. 
And I, I, I completely agree with that. Um, I, th I totally agree with Anna um, on everything she said. In particular, storage, I think, has made uh, great strides, um, vast strides in, in, in integrating into the market. Um, even just this past, uh, past couple of years, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, has rolled out the, the first legal framework, um, one of the first ones in the world to integrate storage into the markets and compensate um, companies um, that um, are uh, deploying storage, uh, compensating them for their, their market activities. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna make a big difference. In, um, in the rollout of storage, in the development of the, of the technology, uh, in making it more reliable, um, um, and having it be a market player. Uh, so I, I think 10 years from now, what we will see is storage um, making even more strides. So I was one of the um, strange nerdy people who who watched that rulemaking, Rebecca. So I'm glad that you referenced okay, that. Okay, yeah. that was a big deal. <laughs> it was a very a big, big deal. deal in the electricity big world. Deal. Huge, huge thing to do. Um, we have another question from one of our anonymous attendees. Uh, the question is, do you think there is a possibility for Congress to pass national climate legislation or efforts really focused on states and executive agencies? Um, well, I'll say uh, yes to all. So, um, you know, we really, one, it's the way our country is set up with um, strong local and state uh, and the national governments are all overlapping and hopefully working together. Um, so really, I mean, we have to make progress at every level. Um, and certainly we've seen, you know, the most progress uh, been able to achieve at the most, and I would say lasting progress at the state and um, local level. The federal level has been a little two steps forward, one step back. Um, but I think, um, you know, the pressure to do something on climate um, solutions is really building. Um, and, you know, we're seeing increasing signs that Republicans are willing um, to take some steps, especially when it comes to like energy innovation. Um, I think, you know, there's some other technology focused solutions um, that I'm seeing, you know, signs that they're, they're really, they're willing to engage in. And then when it comes for, to preparing for the impacts of climate change, the adaptation, the resilience that we need to do to make our country safer, um, I think there's a bipartisan interest there. So that all, um, gives me hope that um, we'll be able to put together some national level climate solutions in the near future. Obviously, we're looking at another, you know, continuing to recovery package and stimulate the economy. Um, and I think there'll be some opportunities for clean energy and energy efficiency and environmental remediation and climate preparation as we put a bigger package together um, to help get Americans back to work. Um, we have another question, and I'm not sure if any of us um, can actually answer this uh, because it's um, it's really a, a technology question. It's um, it seems that a hydrogen economy is re rearing to go, especially in areas where hydroelectric water storage and dams are not feasible. Any thoughts about modular hydrogen fuel cells beyond our automobiles? Um, I'd be happy to take that one real quick. Um, I hydrogen is. Um, back on the table um, and I would say but not when it comes to transportation largely I think we'll see just electrification pretty much straight up electrification there and then um, alternative liquid fuels being developed alternative low carbon liquid fuels um, but where it's critical in the work we've been doing on the select committee um, is in the industrial sector and so um, in order to reduce emissions in our indu industrial sector um, we really are going to need some new technology. Hydrogen is going to be um, an important part of that, most likely, probably some um, carbon capture and sequestration. Um, hydrogen also, you know, potentially as a storage medium as well um, may work. So I think there are actually a lot of interesting developments in hydrogen. Um, and the least interesting ones are actually when it comes to transportation, uh, the more interesting ones are on the industrial and electricity side of things. Great answer. Um, we have another question from uh, Ankita. 
Do you think the use of microgrids will increase? And if so, what could their impact be on the overall electricity market? And I'd like for both of you to talk about this because I'm sure that FERC um, has its eye on, on what's happening in um, the change in the use of the grid. Well, maybe I'll let Rebecca feel that one real quick and then I can add anything. Um, um, yes, so, um, um, the, it, you know, so I, I mean, right now, I think it's a, it's a little unclear in terms of what direction um, we're heading from a regulatory perspective with respect to microgrids. Um, I think right now, the first thing, um, the, the, the more immediate thing that FERC is focused on is really integrating um, the storage, uh, storage into the markets first. Um, that is more, that is actually a, a high priority. Um, and basically because, I mean, storage has been around for a lot longer than people think. Um, as Anna alluded to, you know, with pump, pumped hydro storage um, has been around for quite a while. And now we have all these other uh, emerging technologies that are, are filling the space. So from a regulatory perspective, um, that's the, the storage issue is actually taking front center um, view. Um, and then from that, we will see um, um, attention paid to micro, the, the, um, uh, the, the microgrids. Um, yeah, I uh, agree with um, what Rebeha said there. Um, I think microgrids, at least uh, in what I've been working on, um, actually really come in in a resilience um, perspective in helping to make um, the grids and communities or institutions uh, more resilient. Um, so I think um, definitely as we're, um, as a country is moving forward to prepare for things like storms, wildfires, um, uh, you know, just keeping like healthcare critical facilities running, um, the idea, you know, I think that's kind of the value added for microgrids right now. Um, and we'll see more of that development there um, as people um, are working towards um, making sure they can keep the lights on in challenging circumstances. Hi, I, I appreciate um, your answers to all of these questions and I wanna thank the audience for sending them in. Um, I hope that our audience had a really um, good, you know, good understanding of what we were trying to present here in terms of the different regulatory and policy regimes that are at play with each other across this nation um, to affect the electricity industry and the fact that there are really lots of new innovations technologically and policy wise that we can probably look forward to um, and if you again like this kind of stuff i would say you know check out FERC or your state regulatory commission and see what kinds of things are going on there as well as um anything you know always talk to your congress people maybe um but that's really up to you how you decide you want to engage with this issue um, i'm just going to share a last slide because we're at 11 o'clock now and a, just a thank you to some people who um, were helpful in putting this together um, as always, it's a, a little difficult to do, and I hope that you can see this. I'd just like to thank the Earth Optimism team for um, making this a digital summit and for allowing our deep dive to go forward. Um, Jesse uh, Dykman, who's with SBI, SCBI, who is behind the scenes, making sure that I unmute my mic as well as everyone else um, and everything else. Um, also for the NMNH um, executive team who've been very supportive in getting this deep dive put together. And um, my um, fellow NMNH people, Gary Krepnick, Brian Coyle, Nick Pianton, and Sabrina Schultz, who also have deep dives tomorrow. And I hope you'll um, tune into those and to the rest of the Earth Optimism Digital Summit, which is if you go to the Earth Optimism page, you can view Earth Optimism TV or find the links to other deep dives. 
Um, I put in really small uh, letters down there because I'm not um, promoting these places, but there are some resources out there. The EIA always has good information. NREL has some good information. You could go to FERC um, or your state regulatory commission. Um, and so I'll just say thank you. If um, Anna and Rebecca want to say some parting words, um, we'd appreciate it. And then we'll be off. And thank you again for joining us. Uh, well, thanks for the invitation, Danielle, um, and for everybody who joined us uh, from wherever you are. Um, I hope everybody continues to have a good uh, Earth Week and stays optimistic um, about uh, solving the climate crisis. Uh, we need everybody's help. Um, and so hopefully the rest of the Earth Optimism Summit um, this week will give you some inspiration and some ideas for what you can do. Thanks a lot. Thank you everybody um, for watching this uh, deep dive. Thank you, Anna and Danielle for um, coordinating with me. Um, uh, all I have to say is stay engaged, stay involved, and um, stay knowledgeable of all these issues because they're important. Um, they're important. Um, they were important yesterday. They're important today. They're going to be important um, for uh, for the rest of time. So um, uh, there's a lot going on out there, and um, we hope that you stay engaged and 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 get involved. Great. Um, thank you again, everyone. And I'm going to end the meeting now. And if you um, want to engage with us, I think you can um, go to, um, I don't think I put my email down, but i um, happy if you find me at Smithsonian um, to talk to anyone that was on this panel. Um, thanks, everyone. And see you. Have a great day.